dear colleagues, friends, the audience. We're going to start this last panel of the event with the video from the Ministry of Youth of Poland. First of all, I would like to convey my greetings to all the members of the summit Well for Ukraine, the summit bringing together business people, institutions, local governments, uh, charity organizations, NGOs, all of those who want to help Ukraine at wartime. Also, the Ministry of Sports and Tourism is an honorary patron of the summit. The ministry, since the very beginning, because since the the first day of the war, is trying to support Ukraine. Let me remind you that on the day of Russia's attack against Ukraine, the Ministry of Sport and Tourism uh, made an appeal to all the free countries of the free world to introduce sanctions and impose them on the Russian Federation on Belarus. And several days later, on the uh, March the 8th, the international community, sports community, 37 countries, mostly from the EU, but also Japan, the US, Australia, signed a memorandum to, uh, to uh, regulate participation of uh, Russian and Belarusian sportsmen in international events. And uh, the, the tribunal, arbitration tribunal, confirmed our position, so they rejected Russian and Belarusian appeal to that decision and the Federation, the Russian Federation, Belarus were excluded from international sports events. It is a very important thing because it is international pressure. It makes sense. Sport is used in the current events, current world, is used for promotion of various entities, various states, so we cannot allow Putin and Lukashenko uh, promote their countries through sport. I am glad that international organizations decided that the decision of the Polish ministry of sport and the Polish government is the right decision, is the fair decision. But there is more because uh, Kamil Bortniczuk, the minister, invited Ukrainian sportsmen who cannot participate in the championships and sports events in Ukraine. They, they were invited to Poland to maintain high level of their sports performance and uh, hundreds of Ukrainian sportsmen um, uh, could take advantage of Polish sports facilities, football teams, uh, swimmers, Mm, can take advantage of Polish swimming pools and other uh, Ukrainian athletes fleeing from war to Poland because not all of them uh, went to the front. There are also those who have other duties and other functions to perform. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to maintain policy and uh, we took over organization of international sports events from the Russians and Belarusians, for example, volleyball championships, rugby championships, and many other sports events which were held in Poland. And hopefully uh, this pressure uh, of the... Uh, let us hope that this pressure will lead to a faster end of the war. Dear audience, viewers and colleagues, we are starting the last panel of the conference. It's very symbolic because our last panel, not only having the great panelists, but also having a great symbol. We are talking about the partnerships for the long-term and sustainable goals that we can achieve and we want to achieve together. I'm going to start with Evgenia. Be so kind to present yourself. Um, quick notice, each panelist are sharing a microphone with the panelist sitting next to him. We're going to do a very short presentation. Two people still somehow delivered presentations, so they're going to present, present the presentations. My ask, be as fast as possible, so we can come up to the discussion. I'm also informing you that we're going to have a Q&A session 10 minutes before the end of our panel. So please be prepared with your questions. And let's start. Evgenia, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting for the panel discussion, especially at such great point, uh, topic as uh, partnership and building sustainable trust and cooperation. Uh, my name is Evgenia. Uh, I'm working at the Reform Delivery Office, which is a part of the uh, Ukraine uh, um, Reform uh, Architecture Project. 
funded by the European Bank for Construction and Development and multi-funded uh, project, multi-funded donor project. Um, uh, from the different member states of the EU. Uh, before the full-scale invasion, uh, before 24th of February, we've been working on the reform agenda, on a key priority reforms with the government. Uh, it was privatization reform, as you might see from my um, uh, part. It was also land reform. It was uh, European integration as well uh, in terms of communication. However, with the full-scale invasion, we totally transformed our activity and we actually was one of the um, coordinating uh, powers to deliver the reform delivery um, recovery plan for Ukraine uh, that starts its work since April with the decrees of the uh, president of Ukraine. And we've been presenting our work at the Lukana conference, um, Ukraine recovery conference. Uh, in uh, July this year as well. So um, right now we are focusing our work on um, recovery. We are also focusing our work on European integration and basically making the whole process uh, to deliver this goal. And another our project as well is right now in an emergency stage because um, we need to survive uh, the winter with energy infrastructure um, uh, attacks. Thank you. Hopefully we all do. Thank you so much. The next panelist is Dave Tomlinson. Please present yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Tomlinson, and I work with Hope Worldwide, and I oversee our global disaster response operations. And it is an honor to be here, and I look forward to talking about partnerships throughout the day. So thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Mariana Zawilska. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great privilege to talk here on this panel about the power of partnerships. Uh, I'm representing here an international NGO called Collective Leadership Institute. And uh, we are not providing humanitarian assistance, but we are providing services to different stakeholders, helping them to build strong and sustainable partnerships. And um, our work in Ukraine started in 2017 uh, with a project on uh, creating multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, to design solutions for uh, un integrating IDPs into labor markets uh, on the territories where they were forced to move from Lugansk and Donetsk region. Um, also, we have had other uh, projects related on decentralization and support of local networks. Uh, right now, we are working in Germany with local municipalities and uh, are supporting them in building multi-stakeholder partnerships to respond better to the needs of Ukrainian refugees in the municipalities. Thank you so much. The next panelist is Mr. Pavel Mania. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm representing sort of, I'm wearing two hats today. So one, I represent Save the Children. And with Save the Children, we operate in Poland, Ukraine, Romania, uh, Ukraine and Romania, uh, Romania in the whole region. And we've reached so far 160,000 children. But the other hat I'm wearing, and this is the hat I'll be wearing at the panel, is I'm a deputy director at the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, which is a vehicle for Save the Children on ch for championing localization, shifting power, and amplifying local voices, and actually you know, strengthening those local partnerships and working with the civil society space in, in the region. So this is, perhaps this is the main focus for today for me. Thank you so much. Mr. Brock Bierman. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Brock Bierman. I'm the president and CEO of Ukraine Friends. Uh, we have uh, established a charity in the United States out of New York. We provided about $25 million worth of assistance since March, first starting in refugee resettlement and then moving into humanitarian and reconstruction. Uh, I'm glad that uh, this conference is taking place. It's very important and uh, world for U uh, Ukraine has uh, done an outstanding job this far. And although this is the last panel, I think it's one of the most important panels because, I, frankly, from my perspective, we will never have enough resources to address the need. We just, we just will not be able to be successful unless we develop partnerships that work, sustainable partnerships that will help us not just to amplify, but build upon the success. Because one plus one doesn't equal two. In this case, it could end up work being three, four, or even in the case of a, a partnership we developed with the city of Bucha, the regional council in Kyiv, and then also the territorial defense, uh, a rehabilitation of 30 ambulances. Uh, 
um, that cost a fraction of what it costs to buy them outside. And I use that as one example of a partnership at a local level, but we have also have a number of other partnerships with Rotary International and small other NGOs. But at the end of the day, partnerships are going to be a critical uh, fact uh, that will help Ukraine not only now, but in the future. So it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Mr. Michael Caponi. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Um, so I'm the founder and president of Global Empowerment Mission. It's easy, this one, because we are a smart partnership model, and everything we do is about partnerships. Uh, we're able to amass aid from the whole planet by having partners all throughout different countries, major corporations in the United States, and it alleviates a major cost. We don't have to buy the actual product. It's donated to us, right? So that's one part of the aspect of smart partnerships. The second partnership is on the distribution. End. So we serve as a supplier to the region where we import over $100 million worth of supplies. And then we have 165 active Ukrainian NGO partners that work with us in the distribution that we oversee and manage. And then we have partnerships with 15 OPAS and various mayors where we're doing small and light rebuilds all throughout Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you so much. So coming to the bold discussion that we need to open to all of us, I think the dialogue is a beautiful way to show and express things. I would love all of you to start with a short story of less learned partnership. Make an example of what you had in Ukraine. Months of the conflict, there was something great that happened, and something where worth more. So, three things: great lesson learned, example of the partnership, and something that can. Pavel. Yeah, so, actually, when it comes to lessons learned, that I will start with a slightly less, less positive example. So, I've been part of this before. And I'm pulling like 15 years ago. I was deploying and I saw the mistakes being repeated and again. And again. Talking about analyzing the response, yet yeah, we sort of uh, work by default. So, we, as a huge international organization, we, we implement through partners. We try to do it in the region. That's for three or six other international agencies. But we see is that are they really partnerships? Are we not asking smaller organizations to implement? Ideas that are not there. So, how we actually champion those locations? So, I think we still, there, it comes to lessons learned, we're still learning. And I think we're learning throughout all responses. Are we applying those lessons learned from different responses? Um, yeah. What we see here is a huge opportunity that we have. Because funding that we have for, for this response is unmatched. You know, last time, like that in, in Afghanistan, perhaps, perhaps some time ago, or in tsunami, uh, tsunami response. So we have this opportunity to do things differently. We have the civil society very strong in the region, but actually doing more strengthen those, those partnerships. And as the we try to do that, so we, we believe in inclusive leadership. So this is like a set of programs around the region. We include local leaders, so we call it assistant leadership. And it's not the leadership program that we have enough in the region. People are very able to have done it before, but how we connect them together within the country, but also across different countries in the region. This is what we're trying to do. We also believe there is space for capacity sharing. So that's another lesson to learn. Like, you know, we talk about lot capacity, you know, the term is changing, we saw the piece of building, there was capacity strength. We talk about capacity sharing and how do we as organization the humanitarian leadership we see ourselves as because we saw we we one foot in and one foot out part of the safety achievement. So that's you know, it amplifies the work we do, but we also work for the sector, with lo those local organizations, how we bring them to the table, how we make sure that they direct pulled funding goes, to, goes directly to those agencies, and how we strengthen their the resilience. They are resilient as they are, but sort of how we future-proof uh, this is here at the, the moment. So we have ideas how to do it. We, we definitely don't want to rep replicate the solutions that are already here. We don't want to duplicate efforts, but we definitely think there is space for having that to build 
bridge between international sector in, and, and the local sector for one to learn from another. So it's, so it's very knowledge. So not to just repeat again, very top-down approach that we've seen before, but how we actually amplify those local voices, bring them to the decision table. We, do, we see them not represent at, at the cluster level by the UN agencies, because you know, we, we, we use the language that is not familiar, we, we use the same jargon, we sort of alienate them right, by the way that we do, and also because you know, we, we see how that works in terms of direct funding, like the entire outcomes program, uh, research that has been done, okay, that was it back in May, I don't think much have changed, has changed, Said that, you know, identified it, is it one three-third of the, two-third of the sort of, of the funding that was available for Ukraine response went to UN agencies, six percent went to international NGO, NGOs, and only 0.003 percent went directly to local organizations. So we talk about partnerships, when we talk about such a huge disproportion of funds, direct funds going to international sector, I don't think we can still talk about you know, equal partnership and equity, but that doesn't mean that it cannot change. And I think we have huge opportunity to, 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 to actually sh to, to, to make, to see that power shift. So three points, it's localization. Yes. Engaging in capacity. Yes. Capacity. S capacity sharing. Capacity sharing and learning on both sides. Yeah, le yeah, exchange and shifting power, how we actually make sure that the no, decolonizing the approach. In terms of Ukraine, I think we, we say like, we have to decolonize the, the strength, capacity strengthening, the, the, the work that we do, which doesn't really resonate here because you know, people say, oh, we not, haven't been colonized in the same way, but it's a sort of, yes, we, the system is, it has been designed to, 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 to support international sector rather than international sector. And we still have, we can talk about decolonization here in the Ukraine response as well. But um, can I add to that? Sure. That if we are talking about changing the system, we always have to provide an alternative. So I would suggest that after this answer to the first question, we'll talk about possible alternative scenarios of the distribution of funding and growing the knowledge of Ukrainian funds also. So thank you for your reply. You. We got your three points. Dave, please. You know, Hope Worldwide operates in over 60 countries in the world. We, we've actually been a registered NGO in Ukraine for 25 years. And uh, we have operations throughout Ukraine. And I think what we continually learn, not just here in Ukraine, but around the world, is local, local, local. Buy local, support local. And if, you know, when we, our first week here, I flew over to Moldova March 1st. And I think a lot of us were getting data that everything was shut down in Ukraine, nothing was available. So I think a lot of the international actors were probably thinking we're going to have to bring in a lot of stuff, which is true. There's a tremendous amount of global resources that have come into Ukraine. But there's also been a tremendous amount of stuff still available in Ukraine. And if we can provide funding uh, and provide ways to enhance the local economy, because jobs were lost, jobs continue to be lost, and if we can support local businesses through purchasing and procuring things locally, that makes every partnership better. And I think that's one of the big lessons we learned. What's, one of the things that's really gone great for us, just by sheer coincidence, uh, my team was in Moldova uh, at the embassy, and Alex Romanishin, who is the former deputy minister of the economy for Ukraine, walked into the embassy as well. And they connected, and now Alex has become a tremendous partner and has helped us facilitate with the Ukrainian government, with the Minister of Health, and all the other things that we're trying to do from bringing stuff inside, which is for, we buy local, but we've brought a lot of medicine in through great partnerships, but the streamlined processes that have happened particularly early in the process, and now things are flowing fairly well through the borders, but early on it was very difficult. And, uh, but the Ukrainian government cleared the customs issues early and allowed those great things to happen early so we didn't have to do that. Having that local partnership and that partnership at the governmental level with Alex has really allowed us to uh, do things that we might not have been able to do before. And I think the most important lesson that we continue to learn is when we have staff in countries, use them. Honestly, Ukraine doesn't need a lot of stuff from outsiders to come in and tell you what to do. 
because you're amazingly resilient, amazingly intelligent. I am so personally impressed with the Ukrainian government. And when I look at the cabinet of ministers and the deputy ministers, I'm like, this is a talented, young, energetic group of people. And it's like, how do they do that? And uh, to be able to do some of the things that Ukraine has done so early. So I think for, uh, the, my continual point is work locally wherever possible. And when we come in from the outside and think we might know something that we don't, that's a bad way to do business. And uh, so when we can do that, that's how we can do great things. So lesson learned was a great partnership. Nothing happens with no reason. Yep. Go local. Local, local, local. Local, yeah. local, 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 <laughs> local. Not local. <laughs> local. <laughs> and uh, what we can do better? Uh, you know, I think one of the things we can do better uh, from our perspective is stay in our own swim lane. That's kind of what we call it. We, if I'm not a housing repair NGO, don't try to be a housing repair NGO. Be focused. Yeah, focus on your swim lane. Thank you so much. Please. Thanks. And, and let me just add on to what you're saying, uh, because I think that, uh, one, being focused is very important, but also having that network is important. Now, we're in a little bit of a different situation because we're new, right? We just stood up our organization uh, when the war started. So we literally only have two people on the ground. Um, so how do we, from New York, if you will, with uh, some Americans and uh, Ukrainian Americans, make decisions? Well, we shouldn't, frankly. We shouldn't be making decisions. We should be working with eyes and ears in Ukraine because they're in the best place to tell us how to utilize that. But we also need a network, and one of the networks and most uh, successful partnerships we have is with Rotary International. And so uh, in my last life as the assistant administrator at USAID, we had a great program uh, uh, during COVID uh, working with Rotary on helping with PPE and other necessities. And so we reached out to the more than 1,500 members of Rotary throughout all of Ukraine with, that has 66 clubs. It's a volunteer network. So it's a Rotary club worldwide. So we, we, we established- Can you explain a bit more yeah, because yeah. not so everybody knows Rotary what it is. Rotary has 1.5 million members. I'm sorry, am I getting, all right, is that better? Yes. All right, so yeah. Uh, Rotary has 1.5 million members uh, throughout the world. Uh, they have in Ukraine alone 66 clubs and over 1,500 members and growing. It's one of the gr fastest growing uh, organizations in the country. And it's been incredibly effective for us as we have been delivering first uh, the, the refugee resettlement and the humanitarian assistance followed on by reconstruction. But what's really important is Rotary is made up of local leaders in different sectors within that community. And they know what is needed best. There's doctors and lawyers and architects and builders and so forth. And at the end of the day, those are the people who are going to be able to help us basically uh, direct our, our funding. But it's also important that Rotary and Ukraine friends coordinate at a national level. And as I was mentioning to you before with the panel, it's great to have that local perspective on what's needed because at the local level they're going to know what's needed, but you also have to coordinate at the federal level so it doesn't become confusing and that there's not, a, a, if you will, chaos because there's so many people asking for different things. And it, in our perspective, one, we don't know whether or not the priority has been set, and number two, is there a coordinated effort at the higher level? So again, one of our most successful efforts was to provide 45 ambulances to Ukraine through a partnership with Rotary, Ukraine Friends, the Territorial Defense, and the Ministry of Health to prioritize where those units and where those hospitals or where those civilian places were that needed those ambulances in the most significant way based on facts, data, and information, and then reporting back to us. So, uh, again, uh, that's just one particular effort that we've worked on, but I would say that finding that local network that has the eyes and ears on the ground is going to help you be successful, and there's no, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. We don't need to have a large footprint. Uh, uh, buy local, spend local, utilize as much as you can, as I mentioned, the ambulances. If you've got a resource local, use that local resource. Don't bring it in if, unless you have to. And please add what can be done better, what could have been done better. Look, I, I think the, um, a continued effort to uh, coordinate activities, not in a way that's bureaucratic, but it's just information sharing, right? I think it's really important that everybody understands what's going on. That's not to say that the, the territorial defense or the defense ministry says we can't work with that particular community. What they're saying is that we're working with these communities and they're helping us identify the communities that are most in need. 
and then we can work directly with them, right? So it's not a matter of they're telling us where to go, it's they're telling us what is the most highest priority, and then we're working with those communities to make uh, a difference. I also think that it's really important, two things. Communications, 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 social media is really important because one, you're being transparent, right? So if you're providing an ambulance to the front lines or to a, a, a place in need, the community sees that the ambulances are coming, the local people have that expectation that that, that re resource is there and they have uh, accountability. Secondly, it's great messaging to know that the United States Rotary through all, all countries around the world are helping. And then of course the local territorial defense along with the national territorial defense are coordinating this effort. So that does uh, uh, portray a level of confidence that the local people need. And then basically I would say just a continued uh, effort to coordinate and, and streamline the system so that the old systems don't get in the way of the new systems or, or the, uh, the war effort. Thank you. Mariana, would you add your point? Uh, yeah, I would like to share what you've learned on the 24th of February. Um, and basically, maybe the feeling was somewhere before that, but uh, that was really very, very uh, present on the day uh, of the invasion. Uh, every partnership uh, lies on people. So uh, everything that we need to do um, to have strong partnership is to keep people safe, to invest in people, and to develop trustful relationships. So uh, I will tell a story. Um, before um, February 24th, Collective Leadership Institute uh, supported two thematic networks uh, in Ukraine, basically multi-stakeholder networks consisting from governmental people, local authorities, uh, private sector, NGO people. Uh, these were people from Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, Kiev as well, uh, and what some other cities. What a good choice cities. of people. Yeah. What a good choice. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, what we've seen that um, having invested uh, a couple of years of um, time in building the trust in this network, we've seen that this network uh, was energized immediately in the morning of February 24th, and they were able to evacuate themselves to save their lives, to save their families, and also to save their communities. Uh, one example, we have a person uh, in this network from um, the community of Polohe, Zaporizhia region that was uh, affected by the front line and is under occupation right now. Uh, the person in our network is from the local hospital. And um, being part of this network, people could help to evacuate um, the staff of the hospital to help evacuate families of the staff of the hospital and support each other. Uh, so my take uh, from this story, uh, investing in partnerships um, helps, um, yeah, sorry, I'm getting emotional thinking about all these people. Oh, good. Um, investing in partnerships literally helps to save people's lives, whom you know personally, uh, but also it helps to save people's lives, like, in more broader way. Uh, and um, that investment pays off every time. So speaking about the power of partnerships, um, I would also like us to remember that partnerships is not just a nice word or a nice trend. It's something that can help people to survive with little resources which are always not enough uh, in terms of crisis and literally help survive concrete people. And what we can do better, I would like to echo uh, the um, a colleague who started the, uh, answering this question, we can um, empower local stakeholders to uh, talk and to get into dialogues, uh, to um, have their voice strong, and even like this uh, wonderful event is a great chance to give the voice to people. But being in a panel uh, about power of partnerships, um, six speakers, only uh, one Ukrainian organization and two Ukrainian ladies. So I think we could be better uh, on this. Ah, we are three, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I mean, in terms of speakers, um, not about the moderators, of course. Um, so I think we can uh, be better here and also learn more from uh, people in Ukraine how to develop partnerships on the ground. Thank you so much. Michael. Where is the presentation? Um, I'm so sorry, technical team, we need a clicker. So um, I will pass the word to Evgenia.
Oh, it's there. I'm just going to remind my question to be strict with you, OK? Lesson learned, what can be done better, and what was the discovery? What was very special about it? What can be better, and what is the discovery? So every day we learn and we get better, right? I'm better at this, this year than I was last year, and, 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 and so on. There's a multitude of lessons um, that we continually learn. Uh, I couldn't even identify it. We, you know, my motto is people don't plan to fail. They only fail to plan. And when you have enough proper meetings and enough strategy before a mission and you plan everything and you know where the enemy is and where f live fire is and not and you're going in those areas, you know, you don't have that many hiccups. Um, it's the same thing with importing, right? We knew that importing was gonna be a problem, right? In aid, well, we had to in the beginning, so we had to have proper customs brokers and we had to have proper, you know, um, teams and warehouses and everything set up. So we established warehouses in Warsaw, in Lviv, in Kiev, in Jeshu, in Hungary, right? So the aid can be basically uh, properly distributed, so. You were delivering um, it from US, right? Yeah, in the beginning. Please go on. Yeah. So this is uh, our team in Kursan, a few days after it was liberated. Um, so the 163 vetted partners, right? is very important part. That includes, by the way, some in Poland, a few in uh, Hungary, uh, but definitely over 135 in just Ukraine. And we have three different models, right? Three different categories of distribution. So category one is we have a partner that's Ukrainian, and one is an expert in Kharkiv, and another one is an expert in a different region, and another one is from Chernihiv, and another one is from Venezia, right? And those partners know their territories best, and they come to us, and we supply them with aid, we make agreements with them, we make them sign little contracts, and they have to produce photographs, and they have to go out and do that. That's in the aid portion. The second tier that we have is we directly meet with mayors and governors and we make long-term commitments to them. So this region or this hub through the mayor deputy that's in charge of aid, we commit every single week for the last six months, you're gonna get an 18-wheeler truck of XYZ supplies. And they, the list changes as it goes and that's another form of a partnership. And then the third one is direct. It's when we go ourselves in with our own teams and do distributions. So if our motto is how to get the most amount of aid to the most amount of people, you're not gonna do that if you do it yourself. That's a fact, right? So there's only so much one team can do, no matter how big the team is, and no matter how much aid you have, especially when you have a country this big with needs in so many different oblasts going on simultaneously at the same time. So for the web to work, you have to have tentacles that are everywhere. So that's why we have this many type of partners. This is, uh, an example, but if we could get enough slides, but you see the different colors, right? So the different partners for different regions. So obviously green isn't that dangerous, yellow's a little safer, orange gets dangerous, and red is extremely dangerous. So there's different groups that can go into different territories, and that's how we identify them. And you see we have all their backup, to the point where we know where every single pallet and every single box has been distributed. So this gives you an idea of, you know, how our distributions are and how they work with different people. And in that box is another 
great example of a partnership. And um, Mr. Thomason was, was very correct, right? We are called global empowerment. So if there's not a need to import it, we don't. Uh, we've completed 230 construction projects already to this date, finished, closed with pictures. And every single one of those supplies were bought in Ukraine. And every single person who built them were Ukrainian. And our entire team and all our warehouses in Ukraine are all Ukrainian. I'm actually the only one that's American. And that's because we believe in empowering people. When it comes to food, okay, we have a partnership with many different food distribution companies in America. It's actually more expensive to buy rice in America, yet let alone to import it and pay the, the transport, than to actually buy rice in Poland, believe it or not, where for $15,000 you could get an 18-wheeler truck stacked with rice if you need rice. So we were buying in the beginning product in Poland, and then we shifted to finding food manufacturers in Ukraine. So now those boxes are filled half with food that's all produced in Ukraine. So that creates economy, right? That creates production. And it also is the food that Ukrainians want. So they're much happier with that. And then the other half of the box has all different kinds of things from hygiene to blankets and different needs. May I ask you to share a story of the house recovering that you've shared before, but I think it's very important to hear the story again. How did you focus on house recovering in Bucha? On the houses? Yes. On the houses. Because I think that you and Mr. Brock has almost the same stories. And um, something special about it is that you have this vision, helicopter view, on the scale of the prob problem. So you're able to react on spot and see potential where others see only like stereotypical scenarios. So please share your story and then I would uh, kind of ask you to share yours. Yeah, so when it comes to, to rebuilding, it's an assessment that you have to make based in areas that we feel are kind of aftermath regions. So Bucha would be an example of an aftermath region um, where you have to come in and basically cut all the red tape. The first thing I do when I sit with a mayor and he says, we need to rebuild this school, is I actually say, I'm not going to deal with the Ministry of Education. I'm not going to deal with Ministry of Works. I'm not going to deal with any department. You're going to give us authority to build it, and we're going to start tomorrow. And you can work all that out with your departments and make sure we do it correctly and monitor us, and we're going to hire all the people in your community and give them jobs for it. So that's an example of cutting through red tape, right? And we're quick to act. When uh, Odessa in July was bombed and there was major uh, damage on some buildings, right, in Odessa region by Moldova, the governor was asking of solutions of where the people in the bombed building were going to go. And you could sit and talk about for weeks about importing containers or importing temporary housing or all any of those things, right? But what we did is we asked them if there was any buildings that the government had right there on the spot in the region that they could allow us to immediately retrofit and turn, basically compartmentalize it, right? Put new windows on it and do that. And if you ask the governor of Odessa, he'll tell you that within 45 days, all those people were in those homes already, right? A completed project. So, and it's not a lot of money. So there's a lot of buildings that exist in Ukraine right now that are empty. And there's a lot of in-country displaced people that need housing. And there's a lot of conversations about bringing in additional container homes, which sometimes destroy countries, and there's a lot of things that you can repair right now for very little money. We are repairing a building that will put back 2,600 people in it by just changing the windows in it. And the cost of that is a few hundred thousand dollars. So the cost per person is very minimal, $200 a person. 
So you have to look at metrics like that in order to put the most amount of people back into the most amount of homes in the shortest amount of time possible before this winter gets even worse. And that's why we're working every day on all types of uh, programs like that. Mr. Brock had this story about the ambulances. You stay for different things. Michael works straight away, you know, on the spot. You believe in a structured, systematic approach. Yet the story about the ambulances, I think, very symbolic. Would you share, please? Well, yeah, look, um, we, we're, we want structure, but we also want speed. But we want to make sure it's effective. And we also want to make sure that there's a partnership. And one thing that I, that I should have mentioned is that we insist that there's got to be some, as we say in America, skin in the game, right? So we were very fortunate with the city of Bucha, for instance, who actually doubled our money and contributed to uh, several construction projects. And they also contributed to our ambulance project. Well, I was uh, touring a number of programs uh, Mayor, Mayor Federuk showed me a number of ambulances that were abandoned. And I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing with these ambulances? He said, well, they don't work. I said, well, I'll tell you what, give me the ambulances, we'll get them fixed and we'll send them to the front lines. We fixed those four ambulances almost within less than, a, less than three weeks, I believe it was, and had them out delivered to the TD, uh, TDF. But then we, in, we brought in the reg, uh, key regional council, and now we're looking at 30 ambulances throughout the region and setting a standard for the entire country where we're finding rehabilitated ambulances. And at the end of the day, it's easier to fix $1,000 or, or spend $1,000 on an ambulance that is in country than spend fifteen dollars or $20,000 for an ambulance that's in Europe or even more buying a brand new ambulance that's somewhere around the world. At the end of the day, an ambulance is an ambulance, and they need them now. So we're going to do what we can to impact it fast. We're also also going to make sure that, again, um, they have an investment of their own in the product, if you will. And, you know, I'll just briefly say, you know, it doesn't have to be a large dollar uh, figure in order to have a huge impact. We also have a program called Playgrounds for Peace, right? Very low dollar figure. Um, we actually pay for the entire program, but we insist that the community comes together. And one of the things that I think we've seen uh, that's become very successful is the IDP community coming together with the local community to build these playgrounds. We give them the actual playground. And if anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk to you about that program after we're done here, as well as any others. But we actually go to the municipalities or the villages or the cities and say, look, we've got a playground, we'll give it to you, but we insist that you build it. That you bring not just your local community, but you also bring the IDP community together, because at the end of the day, we know that returning back to their homes is going to be a long-term term issue. And if we can bring those communities together, not only building a, a, uh, a playground, but they're also building a community amongst themselves. And that's been uh, shown us a lot of benefits in other programs that we've been able to support in those same communities. Thank you so much. Evgenia, uh, coming with uh, the same question to you. What was your learning? What is the lesson learned? What is the discovery? And what is something that can be done better? Speaking from the point of your personal view or your um, Office of uh, Reform Delivery. Uh, yes, I would like to maybe share our cooperation on the national level with the international partners and how the office um, was building trustful relations. Um, I think that because we already have this uh, cooperation beforehand for like... Um, almost like six, six, seven years uh, previously, and also because we affiliated with the government. So we kind of have this level of trust, but also it's our responsibility was to include international partners into the recovery process and the de delivery, the recovery plan to Ukraine, engaging international partners into the discussion and also uh, to the feedback uh, kind of comment session. And here I would like to share maybe a really amazing case uh, from my perspective, from my personal perspective, uh, cooperation with um, the Organization for uh, Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, uh, that we established just recently in July. Uh, Ukraine applied to become a member, like submitted its application to become a member of the uh, OECD um, member states. And also just recently in October, it actually really short, short time uh, in terms of decision making as the OECD approved our accession process and started uh, the negotiation um, for us, for Ukraine to become a member. I think it's a really amazing experience for us because b previously we've been cooperating with OECD a long time before on different levels. We've implemented public, we've been in the process of limitation public administration reform according to the SIGMA um, principles, which is actually OECD and the European Commission um, 
like guidelines, I would say, uh, a framework. We also have been working actively on the um, corporate governments for state enterprises, which is also an implementation OECD guidelines. But since it's an initiation of the dialogue, specifically after the full uh, scale invasion, considering the fact that OECD have been an implementer of the Marshall Plan for the second, um, after the Second World War for Europe, having this expertise, analysis, best cases. Do you uh, think, by the way, it's actual now? Don't you think that technology and the structure of the world is so different that the lessons that have been learned since the Second World War might not be applicable anymore? I would say um, we kind of have a completely different situation right now, also considering the consequences of the war scale, the war scale itself, and also um, I think it's important to acknowledge that we are right now already start this dialogue about the recovery, even though we are in a wartime economy. And for now, to us, the main goal is to survive the winter and to help and be united with our partners to help energy system and energy infrastructure to go through the system, uh, the winter. Uh, so I would say the lessons learned might be definitely there from the OECD perspective that they, they can share with us, but I think as well um, learning from doing uh, might be also good. Uh, which is uh, com like coming back to the lessons learned maybe. I would say from uh, as well my point of view as a coordination is really important and it's always uh, a place to do better here on every level and especially on international and national. So it's always come uh, for the matter of improvement. Uh, but also, I think for Ukraine, as lessons learned is that we need to ensure transparency and accountability for the recovery process uh, to build trust uh, with international partners and um, to have this monitoring from the civil society, from the businesses, uh, on how the recovery and the, uh, the management of uh, recovery will be uh, proceed. Yeah. yeah. Your point, I'm sorry to interrupt you, yeah, I think it's very important, and that's our next question. What do you think we are missing to enter the re recovery point? Your observation, your cooperation with Ukrainian local organizations, what do you think we are lacking? Are we lacking education? By we, I mean Ukrainian NGOs, organizations, and all civil society agents. From the international organization's point of view, and then I will turn to um, representation of Ukrainian organizations, but what do you think? There, we still have time before the recovery starts. Hopefully it's going to be a short time. We're all hoping for that. But can you mention what is important to um, correct, to learn and where to learn in order to be more efficient in the recovery process? Pavel, please, because you said about the education. Yeah, so it's Michael just smiling to me, so I'm answering to him. No, it's very interesting, because I actually look at the title of that panel as well, and it's, we talk about long-term sustainable corporations, right? So there are partnerships that need here, needed here and now, right? And then, I don't know if people are aware, like, I'm sure most of us are, about the open letter from local organizations here, like in Ukraine, also in Poland and Joe's as well, saying less bureaucracy, if not now, when? And saying, you know, like, yes, we've heard the stories before, you know, how are you going to do things differently? And but that's... What do you think by, uh, mean by less bureaucracy? You stand for this letter and we discussed yeah. it. But where do you see that less bureaucracy shall be implied? Compliance. You know, a lot of local organizations are being sort of supported by a lot of different international organizations and they have to go through the same vetting process, the same compliance, training, etc. And well, as an international organization, if we can do something better, how we unify our processes to be, to, and recognize you know, what others have done as well. So we don't have to, we, you know, we don't overburden those local organizations, so they have to go through the same things again. So how we can work better and more efficient and better, be better coordinated to actually do things better. But when I think, yes, when I think about partnerships, yes, partnerships here and now, yes, to support immediate relief, and that's, yes, less bureaucracy, because we have to act now, you know, the local people have better knowledge of what's needed here and now. But if you're talking about recovery, do we have a plan as international organizations? What happens in five years' time? What happens in three years' time? And beyond the war, do we leave those organizations behind and say, okay, the work is done, the war is over. But how we make sure that what we do, as if we are, like, you know, if we think about actual partnerships, how we support them, 
you know, in terms of their well-being, you know, when the burden happens, uh, burnout happens, when how we make sure they are actually part of the conversation uh, and enter this leadership space, international and local, so they can decide about on their own future. Because yes, here and now is important, but we, and that we're doing to training as well, but capacity training, coaching, mentoring, and that's what HLA does, Humanitarian Leadership Academy, that we're trying to do. Yes, here now, that's where we call Save the Children, so which is our umbrella organization. That's what they do now, here and now, but as the HLA, as a team with and Save the Children, we're thinking about like what happens in three years' time, five years' time, 10 years' time, and that's what coaching, like coaching programming is needed what mentoring is needed, how we can sort of build those sort of could be the convener, as I said before, international uh, local organizations, how we make sure that we pr future-proof those local organizations to make them more sustainable, more, more resilient, and if they want to repeat their work, to recovery, to, to another response, or you know, to use the capacities, capabilities of people that are responding so well in that response. If they want, to, if they see their future in the humanitarian sector in, the, in elsewhere, that's fine too. How we make sure that we just don't leave them behind. And I think that's what I think partnerships, it's what happens next. So learning on both sides and looking forward and prognosing what happens next. Yes, co-creating that future together. So I think you're sitting at the table together saying, oh, what is that you need? How we can help you and how, you, and, and how we can work together so you feel supported, so you don't, you're not left behind when this is over. Yeah, in many cases, bureaucracy is much needed for this process, and I, I got your point. Mm -hmm. And there's many uh, here in the panel supporting bureaucracy, yet struggling with it every time. But bureaucracy, I think, was created to minimize the risks. So we have not only to find the optimum of cooperation or partnership, we also have to find the optimal bureaucracy. Yes, I think there's always the media ground as well. So I think, yeah, there's some but things I we, have, we I cannot have to interrupt you. Compromise, yeah. And give a word to somebody who is standing pro-bureaucracy. Evgenia? May I just uh, actually comment yeah. um, on the international organization role here? And I would like to come back to the maybe first two months of the Russian full-scale invasion to Ukraine. We've been working with international organizations, or like international organizations overall, have been working since 2014 in Ukraine, humanitarian one. They almost all they left, or they were not functioned in the beginning of the full-scale invasion in the, host, the most hostility areas um, for Ukraine. But also Many there was a local... Many of the organizations here would not support you. So just tell about the not organizations you know. Not all, but you some. Know. You know, some of them. Uh, some of them have been proved in the beginning of that and for the first months. But there have been volunteers and local NGOs who have been working and delivering humanitarian aid straightforward to the beneficiaries in the most... Um, hot areas in Ukraine. So I'm leading it to the fact that it's the beginning. We really need this uh, volunteering movement and the uh, civil society movement uh, from the local support. But then the delivering it for the sustainable uh, manner and building a long, long uh, term solutions, we really need international partners on our side and international organizations as well, because that's already about building partnerships. I uh, hear you, but what do you think? I want you to be really personal here. What do you think, from your own experience, we have to learn from the international organizations, from our cooperation with international organizations, and on the, on the other side, what they have to learn from us? I mean, uh, I would start maybe that we can teach how to do it fast and how to deliver things straightforward to the beneficiaries. But from international organizations, I think it's really important to learn this transparency, accountability issues, and also uh, inclusivity, like being inclusive uh, towards your community. Uh, and I think maybe uh, for me, for my personal, I really support that uh, we need to be local. Uh, all uh, partners should be local because on a local level we really need uh, we know how, what we need. I just maybe want to make another comment because we have a Ukraine very short we are limited really in short, time. but it's yeah. just a matter how we can improve it and actually demonstrate it uh, straightforward. We have stated on May. 44 million dollars USD on Ukrainian humanitarian find, uh, fund distributed uh, across international humanitarian agencies, UN agencies, and local communities and uh, national NGOs. So national NGOs received only 3.7 million of that, which is um, less than 1% uh, 
uh, from the total sum. And uh, international organizations receive more than half. So I think here is a matter of improvement how we can distribute uh, funding here to support local cooperation, but also uh, build partnerships here between international partners and national NGOs. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, great point. Thank you for doing it. So I would um, ask somebody who is a pro-bureaucracy. Uh, Brock? Oh, two, two quick points. Look, I, I think that bureaucracy and coordination are two different issues, right? Um, there is a need for uh, bureaucracy, but there really, in, in this case, ne is need for communications. It doesn't help us when we're getting letters from hospitals and brigades and communities and doctors and different people without some type of coordination because at the end of the day, we really don't know what the priority is and there has to be some discussion. And I'm not saying that it has to go through a bureaucratic process. And again, I said this earlier, we can work directly with the community, but there needs to, have, there needs to be a layer of communications. And I think that that's very, very important. And you asked earlier, um, you know, what are we missing, right? The, the coordination aspect, I think, would be very beneficial. Uh, is it the role of a government? Pardon? Is this a role of a government? Is it the role? Of course, it's the role of the government. Absolutely. The government, and it has, it's not only the role, but it's the responsibility of not just the federal government, but the local government at the state level. Uh, they have to know that coordination is going to ultimately help them uh, uh, set their priorities and be more effective in their, in their helping uh, their specific issue that's at that local level. But I, you also asked, you know, what are we missing? And I, I also think we're missing something from the United States. And this is very important because when I go back home and I get on talk shows or I get in front of panels or I talk to local people at, in the community level, the first thing they ask me is, I don't care what goes on in Ukraine. How does it impact my backyard? And I think we really need to make um, people understand how it impacts their backyard. You said, can a Marshall Plan be effective given this circumstances? The Marshall Plan was very effective, and we saw what happened with an effective plan. And, you know, moving ahead, it's more than a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. It has to be a Marshall Plan for Eastern Europe. We have to think broader and bolder than just Ukraine. We've got to think about Moldova. We have to think about Georgia. We have to think about other countries in Eastern Europe in order to be more effective. And frankly speaking, this will be the best opportunity once Vladimir Putin is out of power to be more effective because, frankly speaking, at the end of the day, I think we, we missed the boat with having a Marshall Plan when, when the Soviet Union fell. And we should have had a much more comprehensive plan coming into the Soviet Union that would have prevented where we are today. And, and that's not just anybody's responsibility or any country's responsibility or any Western responsibility. It's a, it's a lack of understanding the real systemic problem of communism and, se and 75 years of dysfunction. So it's definitely something to be learned from the past. Dave, do you have anything to add on this? You know, the disasters around the world happen in four phases. Relief. Well, the person coming from a whole foundation. <laughs> yeah, relief, recovery, uh, preparation, and mitigation. And, and the problem with what's happening in Ukraine is, in one side, there's exact humanitarian relief. I need that right now. So that's going on. But the other side is a recovery side. And, and so we, we think a lot of times in terms of relief, recovery, but in Ukraine, it's happening all at the same time because it has to, but we can't do a whole tremendous amount of long-term sustainable infrastructure rebuilding because tomorrow that infrastructure might be damaged again. So that's a challenge to do that temporarily, but we need to be able to think in all four of those spaces. And um, I, I wanna push back a little bit on what you said about technology a little bit earlier. Because technology and social media, one of the issues that we see, and, and Brock just mentioned the communication issues and, and putting that out there, technology is amazing. But what, what happened early, in, and I think you, you even mentioned specifically with a hospital. I got an email from a specific hospital I had never heard of. It was a doctor in one of the hospitals desperate for stuff. Same time, we were working with the Ministry of Health already with their list, so we knew that. But through social media, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who sends them an email, who sends it to an NGO saying, hey, wait, you're hope worldwide, you have a $20 million budget. Why can't you fix this? Or America is with a billion dollar budget or whoever it is. And so we have to think that's that coordination issue that's so critical that the government and, and the municipalities and whatever local government has to step in and say, we are going to be the holder, if you will, of that kind of information. And uh, I, I know through our processes, we, 
If we can't do that, it gets very difficult in the sense of external actors trying to come in and help where they're needed because they don't know who to help. Um, and we, that coordination, and so when we use technology, it makes things easier, but it also creates another issue that if we don't, we don't go into it wide awake, we're gonna have real serious coordination issues because people are getting that message from multiple locations. And then what happens is that, well, I see this desperate need, so I'm gonna help it. Brock sees the desperate need, so he's gonna help it. Pavel sees the desperate need, so his organization is gonna help it. And all of a sudden there's 17 trucks of baby diapers in the same spot in Lviv where maybe they can't use them in Lviv, but they really need is food in Kherson. Uh, so that coordination issue is just so critical and the government really has to be the driver behind that at every level. Let me ask you though, I mean, if you don't mind, I mean, don't Please you think, do. let's put the elephant on the table, right? Yeah, can you? I, uh, let's, let's put the elephant on the table, if you will, right? Oh, by doing this, by having this kind of uncoordinated response and a, and a, a backward approach, you're inviting disinformation from our, the neighbors to the north to say, look at the corruption that's going on. And you, so we have to understand that this will be played out in a way that will be not only destructive, but counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish. They ha the, the local levels have to understand that this coordination is critical to our success. Otherwise, it's going to play right into the, the hands of those who want to make the system collapse. And the, the dry, it, it totally does that. And the dr if the driver is not there for that communication to come in, and we don't communicate it effectively, Hurricane Katrina, it, Brock and I both worked at Hurricane Katrina, uh, largest hurricane that hit the United States in history. It was huge. And there were so many communication issues that we just don't communicate, and we've got to solve that. And the governments were, were sitting there, let's do this, and then you'd see on, the, on CNN or BBC or wherever, oh, it's an uncoordinated mess. Some of it was an uncoordinated mess, but in other areas, it worked very well. It just depends on where you're at and what mechanism and lesson you were learning from an external agency. Uh, so, and, I, and that literally happens, the, the tsunami in Thailand. All that stuff happens like that on all these major catastrophes uh, to do that. So we have to learn those lessons from the other things that have happened globally that are similar in nature. Nothing is really similar to this because in history, a super, at least in our history, a big superpower has never come up and gone, I'm gonna invade my neighbor. It'd be like Canada coming into the United States. You know, US, I'm gonna go attack Canada. You know, in that whole coordination. So it's, it's unprecedented in its nature, but it does create that. Yeah, and I have I, I would to just, stop you both. I just add one last quick okay. thing. It, and that is, look, um, let us be the bad guy. You know, if, if the local community is having a problem with a, with a federal or state level, then let us call them out on it. Let us be the people that are saying, you need to stop this type of coordination or this type of bureaucracy or whatever it is, and you need to start in this direction to get this particular uh, assistance coordinated in a way that's helping communities. So look, we're, we're happy to play the role of moderator in a way that is productive both at the local level, at the state level, and the federal level. We're definitely not going to decide it here, but we put, you know, we pointed the elephant in the room, which is good. What I think is problematic here is that I don't understand where this cooperation has to happen. Who has to raise this question? Somebody who have already done the job? Somebody who is in the government? Who is the actor to do it? Who, who, which, whose role is this? Mariana, can you please uh, elaborate? It's all of our fault and it's all of our responsibility. And, and as international actors, we can't come in and say we know everything because we don't. And so too often that happens. Oh, that organization knows everything. They don't. And we all have to show every level. And, and, but but I, this is my opinion who has to be the driver behind that is the governmental level, whether it's the municipal level with their sphere of influence or it's the oblast level with their sphere of influence or it's the ministerial level with their sphere of influence. So it, the, whoever that driver is, and it, I don't know that there's a great answer because it can't be done by one person um, because sure. it's not possible. Just like we can't, we've all talked about, there's not enough resources that any organization up here, I don't, you know, there's a lot of organizations up here that are billion dollar organizations. They don't have the resources to do that, even them. So it's, 
not one person, but it's every level taking their chunk of responsibility for that coordination. And uh, people in the Viv shouldn't necessarily be coordinating for people in Dnipro. Um, so it should be that level, which I, there is a lot of that going on. So I don't want to come across as it's not going on because it is, but that's where the responsibility lies. Mariana? Yeah, thank you. Basically, uh, I totally agree with Dave. And um, we need, for this coordination issues, we need to build so-called local containers. So people who are committed, who have expertise, who have authority, who have mandate, who have contacts with the local authority or some constituencies, who have information and who have expertise. So you can't put all these parameters into one institution or even into one person. And what we need more like coming back to the name of the uh, panel, long-term sustainable cooperation. What we need for this? We need people, individuals. We need transparent processes, yes, and we need systems that function and we need strong connections within the systems between the stakeholders. And um, coming back to your question, um, are Ukrainian NGOs lacking capacity or whatever they are lacking to, for long-term uh, cooperation? I think here we need definitely to put our attention on individuals. Uh, Ukrainian NGOs are working 24 hours each day. They are burning out, they are getting sick, they ha are having uh, mental health issues, they are having personal issues. Uh, Basically, they are also people affected by the war, affected by the blackouts, having two hours um, electricity per day, affected with, by the Syrians, affected by all other issues uh, people are affected um, who are the final beneficiaries. So to have a chance for recovery and long-term cooperation, we also need to be mindful that people in Ukraine will need to take responsibility for the recovery, but we also need to keep alive and to keep full of energy and passion and all that things, people who are working in Ukraine, either local non-governmental organization or local governments or national governments. So that's something that can't be done externally, but organizations who are not uh, Ukrainian-based organizations, international organizations, donors, can take care about these issues and should consider uh, when working with their partners all these issues with localization, um, pushing back deadlines, uh, reducing uh, bureaucracy at certain level uh, because this affects um, the ability of Ukrainians to continue working in a sustainable way, in a long-term way. Thank you. Eugenia? Just to make a small comment as well. Um, Closer. Uh, in, uh, during the Ukraine Recovery Conference, uh, Ukraine and uh, our international partners signed Ukraine, uh, recovery de Lugano declarations with the Lugano principles. And one of the principles is a partnership. And let me just remind that the recovery, as like what means partnership under this principle, is that recovery process is led and driven by Ukraine and conducted in participation with international uh, partners. So for us, it's really important that the recovery, but also the survival stage right now, is led by Ukraine. So Ukrainian government is who's the one who is setting the priorities. The priorities for the recovery right now is actually survival and um, keep going the energy sector. Uh, second one is actually uh, conducting a need assessment. Here becomes a, a basically assessment of local needs and cooperation with municipalities and I think municipalities play a huge role here in terms of identifying the key needs for their citizens uh, from where the government can build uh, the priority list. Uh, but also uh, we just need to uh, be engaged and plan our results with international partners. So for that we need partnership and for that we need uh, long-term cooperation. Um, that's the key, but Ukraine should be a, a driving force for that, of course. And uh, the cooperation here will build based on the trust. Thank you. Michael, do you have a point on this? So what you said about uh, coordination with the municipalities is, in my experience, uh, in this specific country, has been by far the, the best, right? 
So the municipality, this, just to give you an idea, this month alone we had seven zero, seven zero full-size trucks go to various municipalities. So the days of being a cowboy and trying to just show up somewhere and being like, we got a truck of aid and, and disorganized, we don't do that anymore. So everything is coordinated from that deputy mayor or deputy governor or his office, right? He's the one that's saying, okay, in this particular building, we have 300 specific people and we would like you to bring your truck at 10 a.m. with X supplies and then at noon, we're gonna drive 30 minutes and we're gonna go to this other building in this area and we're gonna dump the other half of that truck to those people, right? And everything we do is coordinated from them. They're like the guides in a way, right? So that's an incredible partner that we've had here. Um, and Ukrainians are incredible. And there's different countries in the world where you, you, know, you deal more with central government. And then there's other countries where you, like Haiti, where you just have to operate basically you know, solo because they don't have the skills to be coordinating it properly. But I think here, if people go through that channel, you'll find that they're extremely knowledgeable and know their stuff, and they know what's needed. And there's different needs for Cherniv than there are in Donetsk right now, and there's different needs in you know, Odessa. So. Dave, abruptly. Yeah, I, I would just add also that one of the lessons learned that we find that's been successful is uh, creating an MOU with all our partners. And, yeah, closer to the right. So creating an MOU, a memorandum of understanding, right? So it's great to have a photo op when you're signing something, but also what it does is it becomes clear what it is you're doing, right? You're putting it in writing. What are the expectations? What are the deliverables? It has to be transparent, and it also has to be in writing so that everyone feels comfortable with what's going on. So we insist that we uh, create MOUs with all of our partners. And that's been uh, very, very impactful. Um, but I also would uh, to mention that um, using social media to get out your, your word and telling people what it is that you're doing has also helped us with not just uh, organizing, but also gaining more resources and more actual um, internal uh, people to help us with our, with our efforts. Thank you. Pavel, what do you think? Who has the role and who is the agent for this um, function of coordination of need? So like, as everyone said on the panel, like, there is no one body that's responsible. But we, we know, like we're seeing that in Poland and Ukraine, that UN is always trying and it's always failing <laughs> in, in, in doing those clusters. And, but maybe how we can challenge that as well. And I think for me, yes, we should reinvent the wheel when possible and see if there are other actors that could do it better. But it's again, how we bring those local organizations to the table so they can participate in those decision making also acknowledging that they are impacted by this crisis and sort of and, and under resourced and they're going through all those all those hurdles so just be understanding of that but how we can equip them how we can make that you know how we make, make it possible for them to participate in those decision making acknowledging the the impact the crisis has has on them as an organization as individuals as humans uh, but we cannot exclude them and we you know everything we design we have to design with that in mind that it, it needs to involve all actors on the ground and at different levels but yes we have great examples of municipalities doing great job and that's across the region and that's unusual in comparison to other responses how we learn from that but for me it's also like how we use that debt crisis and all the learning for the sector as well and for the humanitarian sector and system so we don't repeat the, the same mistakes so how we actually make sure that the learning, to have great opportunity, because we see things being done well, we can do them better. But how we make sure that we learn again this time around from that huge opportunity that we have in Ukraine response, seeing great things are happening, improving things that are not happening, but make sure that we, we replicate it in, in other crises. Because as we said before, the other things that are happening around the world, you know, in East Africa, to just to mention, because that's also be impacted by what's happened in Ukraine in, in great level. So let's not forget about that. But and making sure that the learning happens, and yeah, this I agree with everything that has been said. Thank you so much. Um, we have 40 minutes left, 14, and do we have any questions from the audience? Can you raise your hands? Yes, thank you for the question, please. Anybody else? Don't be shy. 
Uh, hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Aśka warchał -Beneski. I'm the newly appointed NGO Forum Coordinator in Poland. So I believe, Paweł, we're going to be working together soon. And also, thank you for raising uh, the, um, the, the Ukrainian letter of Ukrainian NGOs to the international community. As you know, in Poland, also a similar letter was published. And we know that international local collaboration, even if they are not, INGOs are not homogenous, local NGOs are not homologous neither, but it's true that there are tensions on this line, right? And I was wondering, like even in the beginning of November, I came to, to Geneva and one of the INGOs operating in the non-government controlled areas told me that because of these tensions, they are afraid of the security of their staff on the ground that there is a big misinformation with some INGOs, like what is their mandate, what is the funding they, they have, and what is the distribution of this funding that I think we can all agree uh, is problematic, no? So when those tensions occur, I was wondering, like, what is your response in your organizations? And I really like, Mariana, your point that ultimately we have ideas, like I'm a strong believer in partnerships and collaboration, I think, it does save lives and it creates the space for incredible synergies to happen. But ultimately, like, it comes to individuals, like how those ideas and how those strategies are executed on the ground. So I was wondering with your INGO staff, how do you work with sometimes maybe, or maybe it doesn't occur, but if frustration occurs uh, with your staff working with local organizations, maybe you take the blame for you know, the misconduct of some other uh, American NGO. Like, how do you deal with your staff to resolve those problems and kind of de-escalate the situation? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Anyone? Michael? Dave? Please? You know, my colleague in the corner right here is our Hope Roll Wides country director for Ukraine, Vladimir Yermakov, who's sitting right over there. One the of one the who is looking in the phone. What's that? The one looking He's in the on phone. the phone. He's not paying attention to me. That's okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, but that tension that sometimes arises is not necessarily between us as the global headquarters person, but it's, I work through him. My team works through him, his country. And I think the international actors have to come in with a humility that says, I don't have the answers, all of the answers. I have this resource, this program, this leverage I can bring if you want it. We, we have a philosophy that we don't go where we're not invited. And if we're there for a minute and we'll back off, that's okay. And we'll, but one of the things working through and having a structure with a host country component, we have, you know, Vladimir and his staff, they do certain things and they've done them for years. It's, we are supporting them, not the other way around. The, the local NGO is not supporting the international actor. It's the international actor that's supporting the local component. And communication, and somebody mentioned MOUs. I think it was Brock that mentioned MOUs. Having it in writing to start with. Create our expectations before we start the, the operation. And you know we talk, especially at the beginning, every week. It's at 11 o'clock at night, Arizona time, where I live. Uh, it's 9 in the morning for them. But every week we talk um, and try to avoid those problems. And, but when they arise, if we have an MOU already established, what's going to happen? And what the, what the guardrails are. Uh, and if we don't have those guardrails, that becomes a real problem. Because if we, as the international side, go off of that guardrail, we, we crash. Same with the local. If they go out of that guardrail, there's funding damage, there's all kinds of things. Reputational damage is critical. Trust is probably the most important thing we can have with organizations, each other. And trust is built by time. And, and talk, it's not built, oh, I automatically trust you. You know, we, we work with a group in Mikolaev that we had no idea who they were. We, whenever we were connected with the group, but they needed food. We had operations to do that. So let's figure it out. But we were slow, a little bit slow in terms of a lot of fun, because we had more funding to apply to that. We were like, let's do a little bit, prove trust with each other, 
And now we're ready to send another load next week because we have that trust. And, and so that creates that, so that builds that. But MOU is the most critical thing, but that communication and from the international side and understanding that we are the guests. And frankly, and I want, you, Irina wants this to be real. Reality is all the international actors are going to leave at some point. They may have um, long-term programs, but he's not leaving. Over a wide Ukraine and his team, they're there. They're going to be there. They've been there for 25 years. And so we keep that in mind, that we're, and then we're going to be okay uh, if we keep those things in mind. Please, Brock. Just, go ahead. To just so add some more complexity to this, and I think that we're sort of seeing that happening. For a lot of staff that we work, like myself, and I was born in Poland, you know, having worked in, in 15 years, for the last 15, 18 years, I work for international organizations. Am I international, am I, am, I, am I national or local? Who I represent? And there's a lot of people in that position as well, because I think we can use them as conveners as well, but they, they do work for international organizations, and I think that's really sometimes frustrating for them, for that staff. There has to be in between, because they bo understand both realities. And we may have to make sure we take care of that stuff, or that stuff as well, because they're in between, but they, it has to be and they understood that they're not perhaps 100% representing local organizations just because they live somewhere or speak the language. They understand the context, yes. They, they help us, yes. But they still represent, sort of, are representing the agenda of international institutions like myself. Like, and so, yeah, just to recognize that it's, it's, it's a complex issue and have a particular sympathy for that, for that stuff. Thank you. So, look, I just want to step back for a second, too, on the coordination aspect of it and some of what we don't, you asked the question earlier, you know, what are we missing? But, you know, the fact of the matter is, in the course of our time here, we have not had a bad experience. And we have been incredibly impressed with the focus and the resolve of the people of, of Ukraine. But what's really impressive is the united aspect that Ukraine has brought to the table. There isn't anyone that has singly focused, and that is so critical to your success. Ukraine has to stay focused. They have to stay united. They have to be pointed in a single direction, and that has really been a huge benefit for us. And that will and that will also uh, benefit our relationships moving forward. So I just I just want to point out that we've had great relationships with with the people that we've worked with. Yes, there has been some confusion, but I think that's just lessons learned and a learning curve. But the most important aspect of it and the success that Ukraine has seen so far, as I think, is it come together as a united nation. Thank you so much. We have six minutes left. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I would really love to hear from Mariana. If can I ask that? Yeah, Please thank do. you. It was a great question, and um, I would say that a lot of tensions happen, and um, they've uh, also amplified this. Uh, it's about the expectations, uh, but also it's about trust, and trust requires a lot of time, a lot of dialogues, and having this balance between dialogue and structure. That's something that can help. International organizations are very structured. They operate according to standards because they have to, uh, to avoid risks. Uh, but finding this balance between the structure, standards, procedures, and dialogue, listening to what is happening on the ground, and putting a little bit of flexibility is something that is really needed to work for some time in Ukraine and have significant impact for the communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, thank you. Until the microphone is coming, we have five minutes left, so it's going to be the last question. If there's any other question, please raise your hand so I know that there's a question, because after that we have two minutes, quick finish uh, speech, and we are done. So please, the question. OK, okay already four minutes. So, yeah, well, uh, I will ask you if you all uh, prepared to help Ukraine to get into a European Union, because the contribution once in the European Union is extremely valuable. They have experience that probably nobody in Europe has as well. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to answer? Yes, you can, please. Uh, our organization is right now working on a couple of projects focused on youth and building partnerships between young people in Ukraine, Moldova, because we are on uh, a same 
pass to uh, European Union and young people from the European Union. Uh, thank you for that question and also amplifying um, that also European Union can learn from Ukraine. And um, our main idea for our project with young people is not only to motivate Ukrainians and Moldovians, young Ukrainian and Moldovians, to push the countries towards uh, European Union, but also to think what we can contribute and how we can be uh, an important, valuable part of the European Union. Um, a lot of people say, yeah, we can learn something from Ukraine, but also I believe that there is uh, a lot of space for internal reflections, what we can offer uh, and what we, how we can significantly impact uh, for the better the European Union. Great answer, thank you. Evgenia? Uh, commenting, thank you for your question. And, um, actually, European integration and uh, becoming a member of the EU is the strategic goal for Ukraine. Um, it's written in the constitution as well, and also uh, written in the recovery plan. So everyone in every sector is actually considering um, reforming and producing structural reforms to become a member of the EU. And Ukraine actually understands that's a price to pay, um, that is right now uh, our hero is doing. But also is that a membership of the EU is not coming for um, just just because for free or um, because we are right now in the war time. Uh, just to uh, let you know let you know that it's 73% uh, of obligations uh, under the association agreement was conducted and fulfilled by Ukrainian government. Uh, it means that it's not for granted. We are not considering uh, the status for granted. We've done already a work for the last eight years. And the work is going to be done, um, and it's actually right now the dialogue is already here uh, within the government on structural reforms and cooperation with OECD as well, helping uh, to improve our legislation legislation, so it's a matter of modernization, it's a matter of um, yes, basically strategic priorities for Ukraine in all sectors. So we do know uh, that it's the price and it's obli mutual obligations between EU and Ukraine. Thank you so much. Was your uh, uh, question answered? Was the question answered? Yeah, I, I have one last quick point. Yes, yes please. Well, uh, so you know, in terms of what we're doing to help integration into the EU is to support organizations here in Ukraine that have reaches beyond Ukraine. Uh, one of our most important partnerships is the European Democracy Youth Network, right? Which is an organization that's headquartered in Bratislava but has, country, has 23 countries throughout Central Europe and Eastern Europe that bring young leaders together between 18 and 32 to talk about building common ground. And that's just not here in Ukraine, but that's all over Europe. Moldova, Georgia, Slovakia, Slovenia, you, you, um, 23 countries. The point of the matter is that we can support organizations that have a reach beyond Ukraine that can actually bring in that international contact that will help uh, build leadership and common ground for the future. And that will help uh, pave a road, a faster road to the EU. Okay. Uh, if I say one sentence. Please do. Uh, once Ukraine in the European Union, it is great, immense value for the Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to finish our panel, I would like to start with thanking all the audience for the involvement, thanking, thanking panelists for being such great speakers. You are representing different organizations, different beliefs and different approaches. You being different, respecting each other on stage, being bold and being s s straightforward is the example of how we can always find a compromise even if we are different, with a different background, but we have the same mission. Please be so kind to use the la time left and maybe three more minutes to finish up with the place of, you know, you always been asked like, what would you wish yourself when you were 18? What would you tell yourself? So what would you tell Ukraine in the future? What would Ukraine look like? What would we have to do? The wish, the wish for the, fu for the future. Us being here. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, so, Michael. <laughs> Michael, please do. Well, like, present, like President Zelensky said, the day this war started, Ukraine 
and its soul and spirit was reborn, right? So everyone I speak to, every single Ukrainian I speak to, is actually more on fire. Their souls are stronger. They have more will. They have more like, like drive than they did before the war. And we've worked in 43 countries so far in our existence and some really good ones, but I have never seen a will like in Ukraine. And the way this country has come together, the way it's bound together, the way that everyone is working together, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And you know, when we build these schools in, in, in Bucha and in Odessa and Chernihiv, and you know, I see the workers and, and they're tired and, and you know, I'm like, you know, how did you guys build this in two months? They don't care about anything but building it to get their own people and their own children back in that school. They're not doing it for money. They're not doing it for a contract. They're doing it because they care. And it seems like the whole country has really come together to like do this, right? Some are out on the front lines fighting it and some are fighting it, you know, in the offices and some are fighting it from the humanitarian sector and some are repairing it already with lots of construction projects that have already, you know, commenced and are moving. And, you know, you drive around like outside of Kyiv, like there's cranes and everything is like, it's pretty incredible to think that nine months in, right? So I'm very impressed with the Ukrainian people and I, I have 100% hope. I always tell people, you know, do you think they're gonna win the war? I'm like, it's not even a think, it's a fact. It's just a question of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dave? Well, first off, thank you. We know that we're the last thing before you get to go somewhere to a restaurant or do that. So afternoons are always challenging. But, you know, it, like Michael said, I don't, I, as a disaster person, Ukraine was not on my personal radar because you don't have tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. Um, but when this started, you know, we, we had this thing and working through uh, Hope Worldwide Ukraine and, and their partners throughout, and even since the Donetsk conflict, things are continuing to improve. It will get better. It's getting better in various pockets. And in five years, she asked about what we thought when I was 18. I don't remember when I was 18 because that was a very long time ago. But um, when we think about how we can in the future uh, do that, the power of everybody together, including, you know, I'm a, Hope's a faith-based charity. We're, we're our, our roots are in the faith tradition. So having those communications with the churches, with the partners, with everything else, keeping in mind that everyone coming to the table Ukraine will continue to be the amazing place it is. And on the international stage, your human capital is so needed. And uh, just, I just want to say thank you for being here. So. Thank you so much. Mariana, please. Are we clapping? Yeah, I think that's hard to add something, but um, I'm very attached to the name of this panel, the power of partnerships. And, um, Partnerships, uh, they made what seemed unbelievable at the end of February, uh, even in March, and um, yeah, even in terms of uh, EU integration and the candidacy status at the beginning of June. So um, the words for Ukraine in the future, believe in the power of partnerships, keep invest in that, they will pay, pay off these investments, the time and efforts we put into partnerships is very important in the long run. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you again for this panel today. This has been wonderful and just to be here, but um, listen, just keep doing what you're doing in Ukraine. The future is limitless as far as I can see. It's a bright light, it's a hope. There's democracy that's winning and you can be the beacon for not just Ukraine, but for the whole world. We live in a very polarized, uh, world right now outside of Ukraine, but Ukraine can show us the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Guinea. I have uh, just put Couple the microphone like this. Maybe, but to Ukraine, I would say, Ukraine, you haven't messed up this time. <laughs> 
So we actually doing a great job right now um, on all levels, I think, and we need to keep going because we need to survive at first, uh, to win, and to recover. And we need to recover with our partners in the partnership uh, on our strategic goals and priorities, and our partners as well in navigation for us how uh, which country we want to build. We want to build a transparent, open, good government uh, govern, uh, country with the rule of law and democracy. That's what we're doing right now. Thank you so much. Pavel. There's nothing to add, really, but just keep doing what you're doing. It's, no, it's, it's, let's not waste this opportunity, because I said before, what happened in Ukraine, how we manage that response, how we recover, it will, ha has, will have huge impact on how we do how we prevent crisis in the future, how we respond to crisis. So it's, let's not waste this opportunity. We have huge opportunity here. We're doing great things, so let's continue and let's learn from that. Thank you so much. And having a last and short word for every Ukrainian NGO that is hearing me out. I'm a very straightforward person, so I'm just gonna say the partnerships would never be able to be constructed or built without the knowledge of English, the language and the education. Educate yourself and learn the language. There will never be better time than this. We just have to do it and we're doing great. Thank you so much for the panel. Thank you for so much for the conference. We're officially done.